Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, so we are now on to the ninth session. <clears throat> You'll find that this is really a refresher course, but as we've seen in the previous sessions, uh, our understanding is really tested. Simple things, when you look again, you'll find that you know, you know it better, you learn it better. Even simple concepts like equilibrium of forces. So, we are now dealing with and probably we'll conclude this topic of trusses today. What is a truss? How will you define a truss? A pin jointed frame. They can be planar or they can be space trusses. They can be vertical, they can be horizontal. You can cover an entire space frame with, uh, <coughs> with truss elements. Uh, the main feature of the truss is that no matter what the loading is, wind load, gravity load, the resistance is carried out very efficiently by developing axial forces in all the elements. And that's a wonderful thing that can be done. And if the truss is designed optimally, it's like a beam or a, or a slab with a lot of open space inside. So it's called an open web system. So you're using material very efficiently. When you uh, subject a member to pure actual tension or compression, um, the stresses are uniformly distributed in the material. So that if you design it properly then you are economically using material so that's why trusses are uh, very efficient structural systems when used and designed properly okay we also uh, notice that we make certain assumptions while analyzing trusses two main assumptions what's the first assumption they're all joints are pinned. In reality, rarely they are fully pinned. In fact, when you weld them or you put lo a large number of rivets or bolts, you're actually having rigid joints. Now, today, <coughs> with the availability of computers, you can actually analyze them as rigid members. The degree of indeterminacy is high, static indeterminacy is high. But we also notice that if you assume them to be pin jointed, as long as the second assumption is also uh, validated, that is, all the external forces are point loads applied at the joints, either at the top cord or bottom cord or wherever, uh, then there is not going to be much difference between the rigid truss assumption and rigid frame assumption and the pin jointed frame assumption. Uh, 10%, 15%, except when you have heavy members, because then the self-weight will bring in bending. One reason for this is, it takes something like bending moment. Here, the bending moment is induced because of the rigidity of the joint. You can prove that if it's pin jointed, you will only get axial forces. So, axial force is still the main force, but you might get little bending moment and some little shear force. How do you get bending moment? Well, you get bending moment because the rigidity brings in some curvature. And so the bending moment is flexural rigidity EI times curvature. You know that. Now, even if the curvature is significant, uh, the uh, small truss member has very little I value. 
So a low EI value multiplied by a high curvature will still give, give you small moments. So that's why axial force is still predominant. You should know this. Okay. So now uh, we'll explore this question which one of you asked. Who asked this question? In one of the you asked this question. So he asked a question pertaining to this. And we uh, discussed that this structure looks deceptively uh, simple and you might be tempted to say that it is by count m plus r equal to 2j by count this structure is statically determinate but before you look at static determinacy you must look at stability so this kind of shape is called a critical form now you know that if you have a nice triangle you need not have a bottom chord if you are making both the supports uh, hinged. If you have a nice triangle, it's a good truss, you know that, it's a simple truss. Now, <coughs> if the angle to the horizontal is very small, here it is zero, theta is zero, here let's say five degrees or four degrees, that also is unstable. Why is it unstable? It's a critical form. Critical meaning? Uh, you are going towards instability. How do you get instability? Well, let's try to satisfy equilibrium here. Okay, very simple. Okay, m plus r equal to 2j count is satisfied by this and this. Now, if you take equilibrium of this joint, you know that these two members will be subject to actual compression. In a pin joint, there won't be bending moment or shear force. And if you try to satisfy equilibrium, the vertical component of this force in this bar plus that in this bar must be equal to P, 2N sine theta equal to P, you will find N, the actual force in N. Now, even without writing the equation, you must realize that this is so close to being horizontal that its vertical component is going to be very small. You don't need to do any calculation. And if it's absolutely horizontal, there's no vertical component. So if you have a very small vertical component, it means in this equation, the denominator is tending to zero, which means you'll end up with a huge force. And these members have a finite force capacity. It's in compression. First problem you'll have is buckling. But even if you somehow prevent the buckling, you have a material strength limitation, no? It has an yield stress. It has a cross-sectional area. It's not, if you multiply sigma y by a, you are not going to get infinity. You'll get a finite value. And a huge, this demand is so huge, uh, if it doesn't buckle, buckling is the first thing that is likely to happen, it's going to yield. So there's no way even though it looks nice, you can draw a triangle of forces and write all these equations, in practice it's impossible. So you should never have shallow angles, they don't work. Now there is something called buckling which is likely to take place. Buckling happens in members in compression. So actually what is likely to happen is, it's going to buckle and it will push it down and it will take a shape like this and that kind of, and then it becomes stable, but it's no longer the original configuration. <laughs> you want a roof like this, but you're going to get a roof like that, that uh, no architect will like. Engineers will say, I made it safe, but you made a mess of it, right? So uh, when it flips down, then the force becomes tensile. Even then it might yield, unless it goes down significantly. And that kind of buckling is called snap through buckling. Where do you encounter snap through buckling commonly, all of us? When you were little children, uh, I don't know, you must have been fed Farrex or Ovaltine or something like that. Remember that tin lid? So it's nice fun to play with, you know, crack, crack, you can, that snap through buckling. Initially, it will have a little uh, dome like surface, then you, you do that, it will snap through to this shape, then you can snap it back. But uh, real structures, you should not play like that. 
that's why this uh, is not desirable. It's called a critical form. Okay. Now, is there a clever way of seeing this without doing any calculations that a form is critical? Here, for example, do you know of any test? What test? Take the section. There's no number. Okay. He, he's saying, okay, look, you'll have a reaction here, P by 2. You'll have a reaction here. If you take a free body here, then there's no way this can be resisted unless there's a shear in this member and a bending moment. And this is supposed to be a truss member. But who says it's a truss member? Uh, you understand? If it's a frame element, it can take bending and shear. Yeah, but there's a problem. When you take this force into this distance, you should get a bending moment there. But there the bending moment is zero because you have a hinge there, so it doesn't work. Any other way, a simple test? No, okay. For this, it's easy. But for a large truss, you might get instability and you may not be able to see it. What is a, a powerful test to check for instability in just rigid, statically determinate system? Sorry? He, you can construct it, it won't stand, that's all. You can construct it if the self weight is very less. Yeah. And if you have a small angle. But in this equation, don't have Yeah, but you see, we are all engineers. We make drawings and send it and collect our fee. Yes or no? And these things have happened. People have built and it's collapsed. Then you say, I didn't design it, somebody else did it. Or, you know, we, we become evasive. But the question, do we have checks ourselves? Is there a simple check that you can do? There is a test you would have studied. It's called the zero load test. You heard of this? Okay, let me refresh your memory. The zero load test is a powerful test you can apply to any statically determinate system. For example, here, let me just apply an imaginary actual tension XX. Tension or compression doesn't matter. For this to it's possible I don't get any vertical reactions here. I could get a horizontal reaction there, X. Does it satisfy equilibrium? Yes? Theoretically? Left brain says everything is fine. What's the problem? So I can construct it. Yes or no? See, left brain alone is a useless brain. The right brain should tell no. Why? Can you give me an answer to this? Is it not possible to satisfy equilibrium? No vertical reactions, XXX? Yes or no? So let's see if you understand this. It's a powerful test. You're a designer, you say yes. This is stable, everything is fine. What's the problem here? Many people learn the zero load test, but they don't really understand its power. What is the power? The power is this. What value of x will you take? Any value you like. 10 kilonewton, minus 10 kilonewton, 1 million kilonewton. Yes or no? Multiple solutions are possible. Does it make sense? That thing is applicable only in statically indeterminate structures, not in statically determinate structures. You should have a unique solution. Here you don't have a unique solution. So if you can get non-unique solutions without applying any load, then something is wrong. That's the zero load test. X can take any value and satisfy equilibrium. This is not possible in statically determinate structures. If the load is zero, Everything else should be zero. Internal force should be zero. Yes or no? That's the, that's the zero load test. Beautiful test. Let's look at another structure. Now this looks nice. Can you build this structure? Is it okay? Uh, let me ask you. Is it practical? Why? Yeah, no problem. Let's say you build this structure. It's standing there. Nothing will happen. You can keep it there. It won't fall. Why will it fall? This is a hinged roller. 
You do your count m plus r equal to 2j. Does it work? It will work. Yes, yes. Because remember the rule for a simple truss. Yeah, you take one triangle. For this joint, you put two more members. Put one more joint, two more members. Nothing wrong. If you bowl a cricket ball and accidentally it comes and tuck, hits this here, what will happen? It's back to this situation. Right? The whole thing will cave in. Yes or no? You don't have to bowl a cricket ball. You can just blow blow into it it will collapse yes or no if so then locally this is weak it won't work that's how you should argue good so here the count is satisfied m plus r equal so uh, we'll do the zero load test and you can check let's apply a load x a tension x here right here i put compression towards the joint is compression okay this is x then to satisfy equilibrium there i uh, let's come here. To satisfy equilibrium at this joint, I'll have another x here, compression. Then let's go to this joint B. To satisfy equilibrium here, I must have x pointing this side towards the joint and x pointing outward, root 2x. Yes or no? So, if I play this game and move on from joint to joint, you will find that I get a nice self-equilibrating system. All the vertical and horizontal members have an actual compression of x and all the diagonal members have, have a tension of root to x and there won't be any support reactions, right? x can take any value. This is not possible for the same reason. Got it? Because then you won't be able to design it. It's mad. You have any without applying any load that's the biggest joke without applying any load it can take it is subject to a lot of stress sometimes we are like that no no load and we get stressed okay now look at this st structure here I have removed this hinge okay now let me do the same thing this is possible or not What's the difference between this and this? I want to, you know, this is real understanding. This is possible. This is not possible. I'm making that claim. Why? In uh, here, m plus r is nine, and there's no, and j is eight. Two j is eight. This is a statically indeterminate truss. It is over rigid. If you had removed one diagonal, it, everything would have been fine. Yes or no? So, in a statically indeterminate structure, it is possible to have internal forces even when there is no, no load applied. But not in a statically determinate truss. You have to remember that. Example, let's say you, uh, you heat this member. Just one member, you will get the system. Or there is a lack of fit problem. If there is a lack of fit problem here, you will get this. Let's say this member was too long by 2 mm. Just one member, you will end up with some forces here. You would have studied this. But let's say here it is too long, Not, nothing should happen. So that is the key point to note. So this is possible. So don't get fooled by this. Zero load test should be applied only to statically determinate system. And then if there is no load, there can't be any in, in a internal forces. Statically indeterminate structures, multiple solutions are anyway possible, even if there is a load. Because you have to satisfy compatibility to get the solution. Okay. So what about this? In this, if you apply the zero, this is statically determinate. Let's apply the zero load test. Okay, so you'll find that uh, you can't apply it. You won't be able to satisfy equilibrium. So if x has to have a value, the value is zero. Only unique solution, which makes sense. No load, no internal force. But here you're getting internal forces. So zero load test is passed here. It's failed here. It's failed here. Got it? 
Good. Now, we said uh, simple trusses are easy. Compound trusses are made out of connecting, interconnecting simple trusses with additional members like this. And complex trusses are those which are which can't be easily categorized into either simple or compound. Okay. So, if you look at this, is this okay or is this a critical form? Check the count. You have 9 bars. You have R equal to 3. 3 reaction directions. 6 joints. So, it works. But, is there a problem? Can anyone tell me? You can either apply zero load test or you can apply any other logic and tell me. First, let me hear common sense logic. One look and say no, it won't work. What, how, on what basis can you say that? So, I think I told you this in an earlier class. If you can cut a section through the truss and you can't find a, a bar which is inclined, being intercepted by that section, then it won't work. So, for example, if I just cut a section like this and if I apply a horizontal load there, it will demand that these members resist that force by shear, which is something a truss is not meant to do. So, these have to be little inclined for this to work. That is your, that is right brain, predominant right brain with little left brain help. That should work in you. It won't work, but you can always do the zero load test, play this game and you will find the same thing happen. You know, you please do this. So, I can have infinite solutions for x and y is root 2x and then that's not possible. It's failing the zero load test. I have not applied any load and still I can get infinite solutions. Won't work. Got it? So, that's the left brain way of thinking. Right brain, one look and say, no, it won't work. Alright. Here's another one. I change these two bars and put, put this bar like this and this bar like that. Then you have concurrent bars. I leave it to you to check. This is also unstable. Okay. What about this? Let's do a count. All of them have... So, this is one continuous bar. You might say these two bars, they don't look like plain truss because we were told that in plain trusses, all the bars should be in one plane. Well, here's a little violation of that. The one behind the other. I'm not putting a joint there. You can see from the drawing itself, they are crisscrossing, slightly off one plane, but more or less in that plane. Are you getting it? So, this is one bar, there's another bar, there's no joint there. The number of joints are still six. Now, is it a critical form? Yes, it is. How do you know that? Well, I can put X here, either tension or compression. This is tension and this is in compression. This will also be X because these are 60 degrees. These are all equilateral triangles. So, I can get infinite solution for X, no support reactions. It fails a zero load test. Got it? So, all three are critical forms. And now I want to ask you, I want to be practical, I want to build it, what should I do? <laughs> I want to build it. Architect says, I insist, if you can't do it, I'll go to some structural engineer who knows structural analysis better than you. How will you build it? Then you'll have to bargain, say, please allow a little adjustment. What adjustment will you ask? Huh? Additional support reactions? No, 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 no need. He says, no, I won't. I want only this, no additional support reactions. Slight change in the orientation you should demand. What change will you ask for? Huh? Rotate? No, architects are not easy to rotate. <laughs> they are fixed. <laughs> Engineers will have to rotate, yeah. Yes? You show him this. You say this, this will collapse, you will get a bad name. Tomorrow newspaper, your name will be the architect so and so. I don't want to be the engineer. Even if you go to another engineer, it will collapse. Unless you do a small trick, then he will say, okay, tell me what's the trick. What's the trick, you tell. Huh? Huh? You say, these three cannot be parallel. 
Then he says, okay, I want this at least to be vertical. I say, okay. Then you say, make this slightly inclined, okay? This will work. You say, okay, I'll do this. That's all. The problem came because all three were parallel. Now, if you cut a section here, there's an inclination level for it. Similarly, here, what should you do? Well, you can suggest anything. Here's one exaggerated. He says, this is too exaggerated. He says, you can just change this. This 60 degrees should change in one of them. It won't say. So, that's how. This is important. So, you must always give a solution. Don't say it won't work. You have to make it work. And don't say, I'll give additional supports. No, no use. Okay. We'll move on to the next topic. You've seen these trusses? What is this called? King's Post. You heard of these things? In the old houses, you'll find this. Okay. Now, uh, I am applying a load there. Now, I just want you to guess, what is the force in this bar? If you know the answer, keep quiet because we've done it in class. The force in bar BD. All great students. Why? I thought it's going to press it down in compression. It's zero. zero. Why is it zero? He says, side. yes, this bar has got two joints. Look at this joint. If you do try to satisfy equilibrium in this joint, sigma Fy equals zero, you'll find that it's not possible. Right? If this load is applied here, because this force will have to have zero force. Agreed? So typically you can throw it away. Can you throw it away? Why? That is provided for stability. If I, I don't know. Why it? provide member BD? What stability? This is in tension. It won't buckle. Argument gone. You don't need it. But people provide, no? Why? Why do they provide? Huh? Sorry? It will remain in the plane. One, I thought this was a simple trust, simple triangle. The triangulated form is the most basic form. I honestly that, put one more. That load, it was fine. For other load. Uh, which load? It's not fine. Horizontal. horizontal. Who is going to apply a horizontal load? Which is, uh, if you have a roof over your house, wind is there. What happens in wind? So, you should draw. When you apply wind loading, you'll have a sheeting there or whatever, tiles or something. Then everything gets reversed. Then this member is not going to be in tension. It's going to be in compression. Then you have a stability problem. Your L by R becomes a problem. It'll buckle, right? So, it goes into compression and so bottom cord can go. Now, uh, providing this bar, prevents buckling in this plane, but you can still buckle out of plane. So you have to tie it in the other direction also. You should know that. Buckling can happen in any plane. Okay, good. Now let's uh, see, I tell you the future is, the future is computer-aided analysis. Artificial intelligence has come everywhere. Everything is going to be run by artificial intelligence. So there'll be fewer and fewer people will actually do the hard work of analyzing it then. Press a button, you'll get the output. The job, your job is to make sure it's, uh, you know, you're getting correct solution. Because otherwise, garbage in, garbage out. Right? So you must have quick checks. That's why this refresher course will be helpful. Plus, we are also here to enjoy the subject, right? When you, so you must get the joy of learning. So, for example, take a look at this truss. A typical, sometimes it's called an N truss because this looks like N. This is a reverse N for symmetry, for, to make it look good. And let's say there are loads applied. It could be a bridge gird or whatever, a deck type bridge. Simply support, so this is my free body. This is a free body. This is not a loading diagram. In a loading diagram, I should show the support, simple supports. This is a free body diagram. There are so many members, I've given them numbers. N means normal force. This is N1, N2, N3. Now, can you identify which force is tension, which bar force is tensile, which bar force is compressive, which bar force is zero? One look and tell me. 
typically, normally, what do we say? The bottom chord will be tension. Top chord will be? On what basis we say this? We, for us, the beam is what we know. What's the difference between beam and truss? Beam or boulder or whatever. We know that it's going to bend. The whole thing is going to bend. So the top regions are going to contract. The bottom regions are going to expand. So you must get that feeling. Okay. So you're right. So the, we'll get these forces slowly. So uh, you can use the method of joints. And you'll find here, for example, in this joint, uh, this force has to be zero. Why? Sigma Fy equal to zero. Sorry, this force is 10 and this has to be zero. Correct? Sigma Fx equal to zero. And this has to point this way. This is towards the joint, so it's compression. We know that. This is zero. Okay? So you, so this zero, this is symmetric. So both of them are zero. Now you look at joint F. Joint F also you can say, that at this joint, like in the previous problem, this force, ninth bar, cannot have a force, okay. Now, you can, using this logic, okay, I'll come to the trust behavior later. Using this logic, you can see that whenever you have forces of this kind, you can make simple assumptions that uh, F1, F3 will have to be always equal. Why? F4, F2 will always have to be equal and opposite. Why? Can you give me an argument why F1 must be equal to F3? I'm just taking the joint and saying it's subject to four forces. If the four forces are like this, collinear, this and this must be equal and opposite. This and this must be equal and opposite. Why? All our answers start with this. Why? Give me a correct answer. Because? No, no, there's no bending more on this joint. Joint equilibrium. We are not even talking of bars here. We're just talking, putting arrows of forces. Yeah, so you take any, any of these axes, take this line. Just drawing this line, uh, this, these two forces will not have any component normal to this axis, right? So let's call this x, x need not always be horizontal. No? Let's tilt our x axis. Let's say this is our x axis, then this will be our y axis, right? Only these two forces will have components about this axis. If the angle here is theta, F1 cos theta and F3 cos theta. Sigma Fy has to be zero. If theta is the same, theta is the same because it's one line. Then F1 must be equal to F3. That's the logic. Uh, all of you getting it? So that's one thing. You can use the same argument and draw normal here. And you will say F2 must be equal and opposite to F4. So whenever you see collinear forces, no problem. Now, instead of external, let's make it internal. You have two bars meeting like this. There's no external load acting at this joint. You can be 100% sure this force and this force must be equal. This force and this force must be equal. Got it? Either they must be both tensile or they must be both compressive. Clear? If you have a force F in this line, this must be equal to F. This must be equal and opposite. Same logic. If you have a force like this, this must be zero. Getting it? All right. Now you're ready with this background to do some guesswork, intelligent guesswork. Look at this problem. Okay, this is a test for all of you. Identify for this loading which of these bars, there are how many? 19 bars, I think. Which of these bars have zero force. You just take one minute and write down. Write down.
which bars have zero force. Okay. You will get a chocolate only if you identify all of them correctly. If you miss out one, no. Good. Now it's a test. Can't afford to miss even one. All have to. By the way, this P is exactly in line with this. And this P is horizontal. This is the fun and joy in structural analysis. Let's say your computer did it and you say, nay, nay, this should have been zero. How can you get 532 kilonewtons? Something is wrong for this loading. At least tell me the numbers. How many numbers are there? Which are how many bars have zero force for this loading? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. How many? Huh? 11 bars have zero force. Wow. If you give more also, you get zero marks. Okay. How many? Five, six, five bars, six bars, eleven bars. Nothing in between? Five. Okay, let's do it together. Uh, we'll start here. Okay. So let's start here. What can you be sure at this point? Both these bars have to be zero. So we'll mark zero, 18 and 19. Always, if you have a cantilever, this kind of a uh, beam, simply servered beam with an overhang. Always go to the cantilever end, you can do it. Okay, we got rid of these two. Then let's look at this joint. The entire P will go here, right? So these two fellows, zero. But this was anyway zero. Because this was zero, this will go to zero. 16. Then let's go to this joint. You'll have a reaction here for sure. So what can you say here? This force will be equal to this reaction. This fellow, zero. Okay, already you've got four. Then let's go to this joint. 12 will be zero. You already finished your five quota. Then, but there are more. Let's go here. This fellow has to be zero. Right? So bar number five will also be zero. Uh, what about here? The so one is also zero. So you got how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nobody gave this answer. Nobody gets a chocolate. You have to give me actually. <laughs> and was it difficult? No. But the next question is more interesting. The next question is, okay, you will mark the zero force members. Now the remaining non-zero force members, force members, tell me whether it's non-zero, so it must be tension or compression. You have to only guess which is tension, which is compression. You'll do that? I'll help you. The zero force members are a distraction, right? So what we'll do, we'll first get rid of them. You can actually remove them, nothing will happen for this loading. Okay, so I threw away all the zero. So these are the forces which won't take zero force. Now look at this and tell me, make a table. This is compression, this is tension, like that. This is how you fine tune your understanding. This is simple structural analysis. Then calculations are child's play, but intuition is important. Now deliberately, this is given a very high load, 10p. These are all small loads, pp. To make sure you can't go wrong. Sometimes you are confused. Is it tension? Is it compression? But with this, no confusion possible. Like heavy load here, light loads here. So this will dominate this. I'll give you just one minute. In real life, you get only... No, you have to make quick decisions. You're the boss in the company. The 
fellows use stand and sap and come with a solution. One would say, no, 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 no. Wrong. Don't you want to be a ustad like that? Or you have to you have to use another software to check that solution. No. You have to use your brain software. Make a table. Compression tension. Okay, let's do it together. I'll show you how powerful you can do. First of all, you must have a clear idea about reactions. Which will be the... So, will you... You won't... Okay, you'll have vertical and horizontal. Here you'll have only vertical reaction. Which of these two vertical reactions will be more? Left or right? See, there itself, I find weakness. See, you know how I look at this structure? I'll see this as a beam. That's why we finished beams, then we came to trusses. I see this as a beam with an overhang. A simply supported beam with an overhang. Got it? Now look at the main load. This is the load somewhere in the middle of this beam. No dimensions are given roughly. So this 10p is definitely going to give a huge reaction here and here. Crudely you can say 5p, 5p but this is going to be slightly more than this because this length is, appears to be a little less than this. Got it? But in your mind you got 5p, 5p roughly maybe 4.5p and sorry 5.5p and 4.5p I'm not I mean it's not really important got it that's quite high then I have an overturning moment uh, this p is uh, this p will also add it add to this and lift this up so this p and this p is going to do that which has to be raised by a couple the other way which means the effect of this p and this p in addition to giving me a horizontal reaction here, which is P plus a horizontal component of this, will give me a couple which has to be resisted by this increasing and this reducing. But in no case it's going, this reduction will be more than 5.5P. No way. That's why we gave 10P. So what are you sure? You're sure that you'll get a huge reaction here and a lesser reaction there. Okay. And uh, let's use this standard symbol for marking tension and compression. Your reactions are oh, coming. Okay. So one reaction there, one reaction. This we are clear. And by the size, the length of the arrow, you should show an understanding of which is more, which is less. Got it? Now we can easily calculate. So where do we start? Let's start here. This bar, compression. Okay, so compression. There. That's how you enter. Two is compression. Clear? Then we'll move to the next one. Which is the next one? We'll go here. Cantilever. DK. Tension. Okay. Right. Tension. Then let's go here. Bar 15. Compression. No question. Compression. Then we'll go here. What can you say here? <coughs> Which one you'll go to? <coughs> Three has to be compression <coughs> because it has to have a vertical component which goes down to balance this. This fellow cannot contribute. So three is compression. Good. And what about six? Six has to be tension because both these are pointing to the left. This has to go to the right tension right see how easy it comes next we'll go here here what's going to happen this is down so this has to be up seven will be tension okay what about this see both of them are pointing to the left this is hundred percent of the left this has a component which will so this has to be to the right so tension See how easy it is. Now you tell me what to do. Let's come here. What can you say? You have 9 and 13. What can you say about 9 and 13? 
you can say one thing for sure. Nine and thirteen must be must be having opposite signs. Now, is nine compression and thirteen tension, or nine tension and thirteen compression? You are using left brain. Tuck, you should give me the answer. See, look, look. You are sure that you have a arrow to the left here. So you have to have the component of this pointing here. Otherwise you are in trouble. So this must point towards this and this must point away from it. Anyway, they are equal and opposite. So that's it. You got your answer. So you are getting 9 is going to be compression and 13 is going to be tension. Got it? How nice. Now what? What's the next? Now you go to, okay, I'm not giving you the answer. First of all, you should get a feel. Yeah? Bottom chord will be in tension, top chord will be in compression normally. But that's not the argument. Tell me, how do you get this bar force? Well, look at this joint. You've got one force here, you've got another force here. So will this point away or towards? Give me a sound, robust argument. Just one problem and so much clarity you can get. Will this point away or towards? Away. Why? No, no. Just by looking at this joint. So let's use this argument. This force and this force, roughly the angle is also similar, but it need not be exactly equal. Which is going to be more, this force or this force? Which force is going to be more, this force or this force? 15, uh, sorry, 13 will be more or 17 will be more? <laughs> See, that's why you must look at it as the problem that I saw it right in the beginning. I saw this as a simply supported beam with an overhang. Are you getting it? I have a simply supported beam with a heavy load here. I have a small overhang with a light load there. If I cut, if I look at shear, that's why I look at shear. The vertical element, web elements take shear. Will this shear in the beam be more or this shear be more? This is a small shear, just the vertical component of this beam. This is a huge shear. Remember 6P. So this is definitely going to be more than this. Mm. Not more. It will be much, much more. Are you getting that feel? Much, much more. So when you design, when someone gives you an equal member here and here and says, ISMB 350 for both, you will see you are wasting money. This should be a heavier member and this should be a lighter member. So this is much more than this. And so to counteract that, this must point towards. And so that's 10. That's how you do it. All the members you know. And roughly the magnitudes also you should know if you're really good. Do you want to be a skilled engineer like this? That's the kind of uh, structural engineer I want. Not someone who knows how to put the input in a STAT program and not be able to judge the output. You should have an intuitive feel. You have to... You have to be the member to understand whether you are being pulled or <laughs> being pushed and how much you are being pulled and how much you are being pushed. Is it clear? So we learnt by simple observation how to make good guesses. Engineers must make engineering judgement. Good guesses. At least you should know boy or girl, tension or compression. Today it's very difficult but still. Okay. Now we'll take this N-girder. Here also, now till now we didn't look at the right brain kinematics. Now we'll look at the right brain kinematics. Look at this structure. You've got one N type here. This is a reverse N and this is the normal N. This looks like N. Which of these two will you recommend? A or B and why? 
You will recommend B. Why? You like the looks of B better, is it? You like straightforward N, this is reverse N. Is that the reason? Architects think like that. No, obvious here, I don't like this. This is ulta, I don't like. Then you tell the architect, you're looking from this side. If you go to the other side, maybe you'll see the... <laughs> but which you'll prefer? Let's look at the reaction. Are the reactions the same for both? Yes. If it's a beam, the top chord will be in compression for both and bottom chord in tension. Maybe some members will have zero force like this. But generally, yes or no? So, then you have the web members. Web members take the shear in the beam. Okay. Now, look at the diagonal members. This diagonal and this diagonal. Which of these will be in compression? Which will be in tension? See, this reaction is huge. This minus this will be the shear here. Now, to balance this shear, you have to have a component pointing downward. Right? So, this member is in tension or compression? Tension. This member will be in compression. Which will be more expensive? For the same force. Compression members are always more expensive. Why? Yeah, so the allowable stresses are going to be less because of L by R ratio. Got it? So your answer is correct. I don't know if it was good intuition. You should always prefer this. But if the fellow is insisting, do this, make sure it, it is safe. That's all. Got it? All right. Now, look at the, in your mind, see the kinematics. Though normally this is not taught. It's going to deform like this. Here you can actually see the top chord is reducing in length and the bottom chord is increasing in length. This will roll to the right. Can you see it clearly? That's how the top chord is in compression. In an actual beam, the, it's solid. So this is all empty here. You're, it's like an I beam in which the top flange and bottom flange are replaced by top chord and bottom chord. So there's a the truss is hidden in the actual beam. All right. For this, this is how it will change. And if you actually see the movements, let's equate it to our understanding of a beam. This beam we all know. We can draw the bending moment diagram. And we can draw the shear force diagram. We are very thorough in this. With that understanding, we go into the truss. And you can find top chord contracts, bottom chord elongates. And, okay, before we go here, now I have to design it quickly. I remember many years ago in Pragati Maidan in Delhi, they had this, uh, once a year you have a fair. And there's a competition and you're given the, you know, the prize for the best architects. All architects need structural engineers and they want quick solutions because fabrication has to be done. They had to have a bridge there. And they said, I want it, I want to place your order today, now. So you have to design the bridge in five minutes. <laughs> and I remember this was the bridge. How do you do it in five minutes? No computer. Those days, no computer. Nowadays, people use computer. Five minutes, how do you design the bridge? So, you have to quickly say, and no need to save money. He said, no. Anyway, the architects are getting huge amounts. And they all sponsored. They, each state has its own pavilion. Tamil Nadu will have its own pavilion. Is it clear? So, a lot of money is invested here. And there is a prize given for the best. You have to do it in a jiffy. So, very quickly, okay, at the most you have a calculator. You have to order the size of the top chord and bottom chord, they are the member. How will you do it? Five minutes is all you get. Top chord, bottom chord. Tell quickly. All the loads are known. Loads also you have to calculate. Nobody will give you like here. How do you do that? Total load W. Span L. Span, let's say, 15 meters. Distributed load, Luffy, you calculate. Say, with live load and all, say 20 kilonewton per meter. We have to make quick guesses. So, if it's a beam, you know. But it's a truss. And span to depth ratio, liberally, we'll take L by 10. 
So it's one and a half meters, 15 meters, 1.5, it's 30 meters, 3 meter high, quickly. Now I have to order the top chord and bottom chord first. How do, how do I get that? Calculate maximum bending moment, then you tell me. So I, I know how to calculate maximum. WL by 8, we just saw that in the beam. With that, that's my weapon. With WL by 8, I can rule the world. What should I do with that calculation? WL by 8 will take just 5 minutes, 1 minute, yeah? No, so what should I do with that kilonewton meter? I got 5,025. Huh? What should I divide that by? I just divide by the height. So 1.5 meter divided by 1.5 meter. If it's 3 meter divided by 3 meter. Then I get a force. Then that's it. Right? That's the force. Now you have to identify which member will have that force. So I'll help you there. So if you look at joint B, this is in the middle. We can take this joint B. Now these are moments, moment at M1. Okay. You'll find that the, if you want to find, say a method of section is what we do, is it not? If you want to find the force here. So if you cut a section here, then if you want to find the force in this bar, you should take moments about which point? This point, because both these get eliminated. This point corresponds to the midpoint. So if, what you do in method of sections is, you take moments about this point and this force is equal to is equal to this reaction times this distance minus this into this distance minus this into right that calculation is actually nothing but the bending moment m1 are you getting it so i don't do all that i do what he's saying i know that it is simply this moment divided by this height h without doing method of sections in my mind. So this is method of sections. Very easy. So I've got the force, it's compression, I know that. Now I also know if I want to find the force here. So uh, by the way, this force here, I mean the force is the same here and here because of symmetry, is a tensile force here, M1 to H. Because if you want to find the force here, you have to take moments about this point. This is the midpoint, M1. So like that you can work out and you'll get all the forces. This is M2, this is M2, compression, tension. This is M2, M2. This is tension, compression. This is M3, this is M3, this is M3. One, two, three. I mean, if you want to make it economical, if it's a very long bridge, you want to do some curtailment, you can do it. But if you want to do it quickly, provide the same you know, area of steel throughout. Okay, all right, so this is the kind of way you do it. And then here you know, force is going to be zero and the force here is going. Now look at this diagonal, A, B, C, D. Typically you will find this is the movement. This has become this. From this deformed shape, you can make out that B, D has reduced in length. So it's got compressed and A, C has elongated so you can actually visually also see what's going on because your understanding of the beam behavior is solid and strong you superimpose this understanding there you can get it all right lastly the vertical members you have to calculate this is you have to get the shear at all the location you take the shear in this region between one and two this minus this minus this minus this is a shear in your beam the vertical component of this fellow must be equal to that shear so the actual shear force is, the actual force in this member is the shear force into the diagonal D, this is D, D divided by H, which will be more than the shear force. Because the word, you understand, this is how you quickly do this. So you, you can get all the, all the web members one by one. Just wanted to have a real feel of what's going on, how to do it. Now let's take a more complicated truss. This is sometimes called a K truss. That had a shape of an N, K truss, okay? Now, method of sections you use when you want to find forces in a few select bars. 
Method of joints you can use, you start with any joint, there are two unknowns, you can start from there and proceed step by step. Here, can you find, I am labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, can you find the forces in these four bars? What should you do? Well, obvious thing to do is to cut a section like that. But method of sections gives you three equations of equilibrium in the free body. Right? Sigma fx equals 0, sigma my equals 0, sigma m equals 0, or maybe two, three versions of sigma m equals 0, but you will get only three independent equations. You've got four unknowns. So how do you crack it? So he studied the book and no, you can still do it. We'll see that later. So what he's saying is, need not always cut a vertical section. You can cut a clever section. Okay, first thing to do is to draw the free body and calculate your reactions. Okay, so this is the load, this is the load. So if you calculate your reactions, which you can do very quickly, you will get some numbers. Okay, we we'll leave that. That's an easy thing to do. Now what he's saying is, cut a section like this because he's read the book. When you cut a section like this, then you are exposing only two unknowns, right? And you can say, take moments about this point. You'll have forces equal and opposite here, don't worry. They don't. Take moments about B and then N1 into this height is equal to the rest of the force. You can get N1 and similarly take sigma F x equals 0 and you can get this. Okay, that's one way. But can you tell me a way where I just cut a section like this, a first intuitive thing and still get it right? No, no, no. You have four unknowns, no? Here I cut it cleverly, I got two unknowns. I can handle three unknowns. What should I, yeah? Three and four, there is something. What is three and four? Three and four have to be opposite. equal and opposite. That's like we did the problem earlier. Equal and opposite. Why? Because if you cut sigma fx here at this joint, these two must be equal and opposite. So you've got only three unknowns. You can do that. So uh, you can cut a section here. And you can say that these two are equal and opposite. And you can st and say n4 is equal to minus n3. And then three unknowns, you can still solve the problem. Okay? All right. So, it's just a flavor. We are not here to solve any problem. But uh, you can intelligently apply method of joints where you need to apply method of sections. Here, you have a tough problem. Okay? You have a compound truss. The question is this. Can you, and this is a load acting P, imagine there's a boulder. So if this is P and this is 2 meters and this 3 meters, the reaction here will be 2 divided by 5, so 0.4 P, 0.6 P, no horizontal reaction. Got it? This is, a, this is a famous problem. The challenge is find any bar force you can. Even one bar force if you can do. 10,000 rupees. Uh, you read the book. Okay. Those, don't, no cheating a lot. Give others a chance. Those who read the book or attended my earlier classroom, fresh thinkers, how will you do it? See, this, in the olden days, they actually had to find ways to do it because there were no computers to crack it. We have become spoilt. Somebody else will do it. No, you have to do it. And you have to do it in five minutes. It's a statically determined truss. So you'll find that wherever you cut the section, if you cut a section like this, you're back to method of joints. In method of joints, you've got three unknowns and two equations. Method of joints, you'll have only sigma fx equals zero, sigma f y equals zero for every joint. Wherever you cut a section, you have a problem. Then you'll say, I'll do, I've seen all kinds of answers. I'll cut some funny section like this, like this, I'll reverse it. Won't help. Wherever you cut, you've got 
four members in method of sections or if it degenerates to method of joint, three members. So you have to do some clever cutting. You know, nowadays in the barber shop that you have near the hostel, there are so many varieties of cutting, no? So you have to use one of those scissors which will still solve the problem. Which scissor? How will you cut? I am giving you a clue. You need not cut one continuous section. You can use step cutting. What is that? How will you do it? No, you know the answer because you attended the class. What is a step cutting solution? Okay, so I'll show you. He's right. See, okay, m plus r equal to 2j, everything is uh, satisfied. Okay, so we know this. So, method of section is what you have to apply, but we'll do a unique section cutting. What we'll do is cut like this. Imagine this is one triangle, and you take a pair of scissors and cut it here, cut it here and cut it here. You have isolated this free body. Actually, this shading is only to help you. There's no, you can remove the shading. Right? Cut, cut, cut. Free body. How many unknowns I have? Three. How many equations I have? Three. I can get three. Sigma fx equals zero. Sigma fy equals zero. Sigma or sigma moment about this point. You can crack it. Right? Or you could take this other triangle. I leave it to you to do this. The idea in this session is to understand powerful ways of solving statically determinate problems. There is one master solution everybody can do. What is that? See, if you go back to this problem, you have enough number of equations and you have so many unknowns, right? You have nine unknowns and nine equations. How do you solve them? Simultaneously, right? So you have to write down painfully all the equations. So there's a powerful method where you can write down the equations using a beautiful system called the tension coefficient method. So this is, at least let me introduce you to the method, a famous method called a tension coefficient method, which is really a method of joints, but writing down the equation systematically. It is especially useful when you do space stresses. So let's take a space stress problem. I have a joint here and let's say there are four bars or there could be 500 bars, I don't care. This is one joint. I must have a coordinate system. So this joint A has coordinates x, a, y, a, z, a. I can choose any origin for my reference and I'm using a Cartesian coordinate system. Now, there is, there are f loads externally that are applied here, which have components in the x, y, and z directions, f, a, x in the x direction, f, a, y in the y direction, f, a, z in the z direction. And I'm putting unit vectors here, i, j, k. You understand? Now, I can easily write down equations of equilibrium. How do I write it? What is a clever way to get the inclinations. Remember in the last class we said that there is a beautiful relationship which ties down the force field with the displacement field, the geometry with the statics. So all these four bars, the angles of inclination are very important. What is a good measure of angle of inclination? It's called direction cosine. You would have studied so that's the idea you need to use. So this bar is connected to some other bar whose joint, let's call x1, y1, z1. This bar is connected to another bar there. Let's say it's x4, y4, z4. This bar is connected to another bar whose coordinates is. And in the beginning, I know all the coordinates. So I've got these dimensions. And, if, and I give these numbers, the bar force here, I'm assuming tension positive is N1, bar force here is N2, N3, N4. Then I can write, I'll, I can write my equations of equilibrium in a certain way. 
Sigma fx equal to zero means the external load acting in the x direction, fax, the scalar component, plus all the components of these bar forces in the x direction should be equal to zero. Got it? Now, what is the bar force in any direction? It is ni ith bar into the direction cosine in the x direction. Right? It's like n cos theta. That cos theta is given by Li. Remember the direction goes in L, M, N. So what you have to do is to take the node at this end, this minus this x value divided by the length of this bar. That's the direction cosine. So very easy, x1, y1, z1, x a, y a, z a. Just subtract this from this, this from this, this from this, and divide by the length, you got the three direction cosines. And we are going to define, instead of dealing with n1, n2, n3, n4, let me deal with something called t1, t2, t3, t4, which is defined as n1 divided by l1, n2 divided by l2, n3. Are you getting it? So that's my, it has units of kilonewton per meter. Then you'll find that this equation simplifies to this. And so you've got three equations. If you write these equations systematically, you can solve the problem. Okay, so we will look at this same problem or a slightly different problem, solve it by the tension coefficient method in the next class. I need to go, so we will stop for today. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, see you next week. Thank you.